Stay with me. Oh. Okay, we're going break. Okay, good morning, everyone. Stay with me. It's 10 o'clock in the morning. It's Thursday. It's almost Friday, and the weekend will be here. And probably like me, a lot of you are kind of burned out, right? <laughs> And we've been doing equity and diversity since March, really. I mean, before that, of course, but definitely since, since March, we have been engrossed in this subject matter. Um, so I am pleased that you all have decided to join us this morning to talk more so about Santa Monica College uh, and our hiring, our employment piece as it pertains or relates to equity and, and diversity. Um, I'm going to go ahead and have Cyrus uh, put up the PowerPoint for us. Uh, but I do again want to thank you all for being present as, as being present as part of human resources uh, focusing on diversity and equity series. And, and the presentation today is is really twofold. Okay. And we are going to attempt to introduce you to our diversity report, but through this presentation. And just a little background about this presentation. Uh, the district uh, submitted a proposal to this conference, Diversity and Leadership Conference, uh, that was being held in spring of 2020 at Harvard. And we submitted this presentation, this proposal, and it was accepted. And so, you know, that was really exciting for us. Oh, wow, they really wanna hear about what's happening at Santa Monica College in Santa Monica, California. And, and we're gonna go to Harvard and we're gonna pr present this uh, to this group of uh, leaders and educators and, what an opportunity for us, you know? Uh, but of course, COVID hit. COVID hit, we were supposed to do this presentation in, I think it was early April, like April 4th. I remember the date, <laughs> April 4th it was, uh, but we weren't able to attend. So part of this effort though, was a, a collaboration between Dr. Jeffrey, myself, Treshawn Hall Baker, as well as uh, Lisa Winter, I believe, was involved. Uh, but the, the true author of this report is Lori Heyman, who is our admin assistant confidential. And I have to give her her props at this meeting because uh, Treshawn and I, I think we're at a conference and Lori was here. We had like one or two days to get this done and Lori made it happen. So I have to truly uh, recognize her for uh, this particular presentation. And then on top of that, we also have this diversity report. And again, I have to give Lori Heyman her, her, her props because uh, she plays a, a major role in authoring that report, pulling that data and getting it together. Um, but as you probably know, and I know this for sure, not too many folks probably read that report. And so it's really important to me as the vice president of HR that folks are aware of that report, that it exists and why we need it, why we do it, okay? Uh, I mean, really. And I'm seeing in the chat, people like our photos on this slide. So <laughs> thank you people. Um, so with that said, this, this presentation was entitled uh, Santa Monica College, a case study, the challenges of changing a community college culture. And so what we're going to try to do is, again, walk you through this presentation as best that we can and familiarize you with the, the diversity report. So today's presentation um, will consist of, and you can go back to the slide, Cyrus, the presenter side. Uh, myself, Vice President of Human Resources, uh, Dr. Treshawn Hall Baker, our Dean of Human Resources, as well as Lori Heyman, um, as well. Dr. Jeffrey, I, hopefully, is in the audience, but she's not going to be part of this presentation today. But I employ her if she is in the audience to definitely interject when she feels it's necessary, because she again. Um, contributed to this report and was going to be with us when we did this presentation 
at Harvard, okay? So with that said, um, let's move on with the presentation. And so there's gonna be probably a little bit of back and forth as well. Um, we all are gonna take, a, take turns presenting some of this information. You know me, I need this to be engaging. Uh, so if you have questions, like I said, put it in the chat, raise your hand, whatever it is. If you just want to make a comment, you can certainly do that as well. Uh, but this presentation is really uh, for discussion purposes later. Uh, we talk a lot about student equity. Uh, we haven't spent a lot of time on uh, how we can move the needle with our workforce, specifically and especially our full-time faculty. Uh, I'll just put it out there and, and say it, okay? So next slide, Cyrus. So, proud to be SMC. Trust me, everybody wants to work at Santa Monica College. They most definitely do. Students from all over the world come to Santa Monica College. Everybody wants to be here. Trust me, they, they really do. We're the number one transfer institution, all of those things. Santa Monica truly attracts and, re and retains an outstanding workforce of faculty, staff, management. However, comma, as you often hear me say, we are still challenged with diversifying our workforce and ensuring that the faculty, staff, the management team mirror our student body. I think we all know this. We also are challenged with ensuring that our faculty, staff, management mirror our diverse population in the Los Angeles County area as well, okay? And, you know, our diversity report tells a story, which is why, uh, you know, Cyrus is going to put that in the chat for me, that link to the, to the diversity uh, report. Like I said, we're gonna to try to do a little back and forth, but it might be a little difficult, but I wanna make sure that you have that link to the report. And I'm gonna refer you and probably Treshawn and Lori might refer you to some pages in that, that report where you can get more detailed information. But again, at the end of the day, you know, we, we, are, we are challenged with that. Um, you know, I can say that our classified staff and our management to a certain extent are diverse. Where we struggle uh, with diversity amongst the ranks is with our faculty. And I mentioned full-time earlier, but also with part-time. And we're going to talk a little bit about that uh, as well. Cyrus, I think we lost the PowerPoint. At least I did. Give me one second, folks. OK, sorry about that. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, thank you. So, you know, at, at this point in the game, uh, diversification of our workforce has been, it's been slow. Again, much slower with, uh, with our faculty, but it's been steady to a certain extent. It, it really has been. So you might say right now, we just had a SERP and we lost all these people. That's true. And remember this report, this diversity report is from 2019. Uh, this report is done every two years. So we are right now getting ready to put that report together as well. Thank you very much, Lori Heyman. <laughs> because it's a lot of work, it, it truly is. So saying all that to say that this particular presentation is gonna focus primarily on the faculty especially as they have a more of a direct impact on the students. As I said earlier, we, we, do, we do okay uh, with the other groups, but we do struggle with our faculty. Um, and I love this quote, uh, no matter what you do, it will never amount to anything more than a single drop in a limitless ocean. Yes, but what is an ocean but a multitude of drops? So we have to keep working at this. Uh, no matter what. It's, like I said, diversity at Santa Monica College, increasing diversity at SMC in our workforce has been slow, but it has been steady to, to a certain extent, but we, we need to do more work with our faculty. Go ahead to the next slide. So, 
So how have we progressed? Look at this slide. Little bit of background. Where have we been? Where are we now? Where are we going? But this tells us where we've been. This college was established back in 1929 with a mere 153 students with the LA County population of 1 million people. Really? But where are we today? 2019, this, this is uh, information from 2019. Like I said, we'll be working on 2020, um, which will be actually, which will look very different. But 2019, we had 31,492 students with a population of 10.3 million people. LA County population, I'm gonna start there, has changed immensely over the years. Not just the number of people, but truly who we are and what we look like, truly. That can be said the same thing for our students, of course. Again, I'm a visual person. Think about Santa Monica College back in 1929 in the 30s, the 40s, the 50s, probably even the 60s. You can imagine what it looked like. It was probably very white, very Caucasian, right? But now we've come forward and in 2019, we've got 31,492 students. And I've already said that our population has changed immensely. It looks different. So it's only obvious that the students look different too. Our population here at the college has changed immensely. The students are different, everything's different, but the same should not be true. What am I trying to say? Back up. Everything looks different. Unfortunately, what doesn't look different, stay with me, <laughs> is pretty much our, our, our faculty, to be honest. Our faculty, and you'll see it later in the presentation, are still primarily Caucasian. And that's a problem because again, our students are not, and you're gonna see that, that later. So the same should be true for our workforce. If the student population is changing in many different ways, but definitely um, eth by ethnicity, then of course you would expect that the workforce, especially the faculty would change as well, but, but it really hasn't. Next slide. And so this is a, a, a infograph or a graph of um, our student demographics. So again, back in the day, Students who lived in the area probably attended school here, probably went to Santa Monica College because they lived around the corner or by the beach or, you know, they were, they were in the, 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 the area. But that has so changed everyone. It's, it's, you'd be amazed. Look at this infograph. This speaks volumes. Our students are coming from everywhere everywhere and this is just a small snapshot if we had the the bigger graph they're coming from e even further away but you can see we're serving a little bit of everybody that's coming from from all over los angeles county and then you know can you imagine what some of them had to do or have to go through to get here you know i think a lot of them might be I know they miss being on campus, but I'm assuming some of them are probably happy about not having to commute here to Santa Monica College because they're coming from such far distances. It's, it's amazing. This graph always amazes me because it just tells us how far reaching we are. Okay. So go ahead to the next slide. So a lot of what we do, um, here in HR is we collect data as it pertains to uh, em employment matters, of course. Of course we do and, and what uh, our workforce looks like here. But in order to make some decisions and, and, and plans and figure out how we need to, to move forward, when we put together the diversity report, we always have to look at the County of Los Angeles. 
what does what does LA look like? Um, what's out there? Who's out there? Especially when we talk about uh, increasing diversity and equity here at Santa Monica College. Our institution, our workforce, our students, we would expect them to reflect Los Angeles County. And like I said earlier, it has definitely changed over the years. So the diversity report, and like I said, it's a huge report, but there are some appendices that I want you to review, which would be appendix one and two, which you're gonna find on pages 52 and 53 of that diversity report. I mean, there's also a short narrative on page uh, 12 and 13 in the diversity report about the County of Los Angeles. So what Lori does a fabulous job uh, with is taking that information and ensuring that we know what we're working with out in the county, what it, what it looks like. And, and this is a, a graph to kind of show uh, what's out there, what we look like. This data is collected from the state of California and the County of Los Angeles census information. And the information I have to keep saying is important because it provides us with a picture of the Los Angeles demographics. And what's very telling on this graph, as you can see, are that persons of Hispanic or Latin origin are projected to compromise 50% of the total population of the county. And this is projected to rise. Again, this slide is very telling about, again, what we're working with in the Los Angeles County and very telling of who our students might be, especially if they're coming from all over Los Angeles County. More than that, the Caucasian percentage is at 26%, right? So although 50% uh, represents Hispanic uh, or Latin, Latinx folks, uh, all other categories here are still people of color. Very, very telling, very telling. Again, LA County has changed since 1929 and coming forward. It's really, really changed. Next slide, Cyrus. So at this juncture, uh, let's look at our student. Let's, lo let's look at the student ethnicity here at Santa Monica College. And remember the title of this case study was Challenges of Changing a Community College Culture, the challenges. This is one of our, this is, this is one of our challenges here. Again, I've already said the number of Hispanic students and other students of color attending Santa Monica College mirrors that within the state of California and LA County. It does. Our challenge at Santa Monica College is diversifying our faculty to better reflect this student population. And again, I'm gonna refer you back to the diversity report. There's a, a narrative on page nine that talks about the overall progress towards diversity within the full-time faculty. And I do want to point this out because I think it's important. Again, we, you keep hearing me say that we've made some strides. We have, we've been pretty steady, but we still have so much work to do. In that narrative, it basically says that minority populations um, remain underrepresented, uh, underrepresented, but over time, diversification efforts have resulted in change. Hispanic self-identifying full-time faculty accounted for 13% in 2009, um, increasing to 17% in 2019. And Asian comprised 9% uh, of full-time faculty in 2009 and 12% in 2019. Uh, not all ethnic groups experienced gains during this period of time. African-Americans were 12% of full-time faculty in 2009, 13% in fall 27, but slid to 12% in 2019. And I bring this up because, again, look at our student ethnicity. Our faculty 
have not changed much. I have to keep putting that out there because it is truly the challenge that we face in how do we move the needle. Again, we've made some progress, but we have so much more to make in order to truly mirror what our student population looks like, or at least looked like in 2019. Might be a little different, now that we're in this COVID area, this remote area, enrollment has declined, of course. Um, a lot of adjuncts have lost their class assignments because we don't have the classes. Uh, so, so again, there are a lot of moving parts, but again, I keep saying we still have work to do. And, but this is truly, I think, our biggest challenge in, in moving the needle to ensure that the workforce, the faculty reflect the student ethnicity. Next slide, Cyrus. So the challenge, how do we increase underrepresented groups in the faculty and, and leadership positions? But again, I'm primarily talking about the faculty here when there is little personnel turnover. It's another big challenge for us. Um, I've already mentioned that enrollment is down, it's continuing to de decrease, unfortunately, in this budget crisis and in this, in this um, COVID world that we live in right now. Um, you know, adjuncts have lost classes um, but again, the part-time faculty, that's another one of the groups that lacks overall diversity as well. And we'll talk a little bit about that. And there's some great um, charts in the diversity report that clearly show what we look like um, as far as adjunct faculty departmentally. And I encourage people to, to take a look at that. We also have another group uh, that's referred to as, as associate faculty, still part-timers. Um, but they have employment rights. That group lacks diversity as well. We've got full-time faculty, right? Great full-time faculty, but the, and we've got classified staff, we've got managers, we've got all of that. But the point I'm trying to make is that nobody leaves. <laughs> nobody leaves, I'm one of them. Came here in 1990 and I never left, never left. And there's a whole lot of you in this session right now that have done the same thing and probably plan to do the same thing. But what does that do for, for us as a district? And, and before I get to that, you know, we just had the SERP, the retirement incentive. And so um, several people took that opportunity and they're gone. But I'm here to tell you Santa Monica College, uh, the numbers still probably haven't changed much. That all that information will be reflected in the next diversity report, but it didn't really move the, the needle. Um, people don't leave. When it comes to the associate faculty, and I'm gonna talk about them later, uh, the majority of them are Caucasian, since we're talking about ethnicity and, and increasing diversity. But they're so, and, and a lot of them left, a lot of them took, uh, some of them did take the cert. Some of them did, but there are so many uh, associate, so many part-time faculty waiting in the wings because they're eligible for associate faculty and they're just waiting for people to leave so they can get that status as well. But I'm here to tell you that they are primarily Caucasian as well. So if people aren't leaving, how do we get to the point where we can even Again, recruitment for Santa Monica College is not a big deal. Everybody wants to come here. Not a, not a, our, our pools are diverse. They are when it comes to ethnicity. But again, we are challenged because if people don't leave, we don't always have the opportunity to replace them. And then when we do replace them, yes, we have an opportunity to, to replace them with uh, diverse groups of people, but Again, the needle still doesn't move because Santa Monica College right now is very heavy with Caucasian staff, um, uh, Caucasian faculty. We are, again, just being honest. But the diversity report, the data supports everything that I'm saying here. Longevity is huge at Santa Monica College. Like I said, people just do not leave. And opportunities to increase diversity in hiring is going to be limited uh, during this budgetary crisis as well. It, it just is. There will continue to be very little personnel turnover. 
Okay. Uh, next slide. So I, so I like this slide. This is one of Lori's slides. It's like, how does she find these things? <laughs> how do we get there? And the cartoon says, after further re review, I'm going to move the goalposts once again, right? Since Santa Monica Colleges, you know, our, our situation here is fluid, it's dynamic, it's ever changing. But I like to think that you agree with me that the end goal is to build a workforce to ensure student success. And part of doing that, like I said, we talk about student equity um, all day, every day. We do, and we are making great strides there. We truly are. But when we have those opportunities to bring in new people, different people, diverse groups of people, how are we going to get there? Again, another challenge for this district, trying to figure that out. Next slide, Cyrus. Go back one, yeah. So it's obvious that we need to get on a path. You know, how do we, how do we overcome so many challenges? What's our plan? What path do we take to diversify our workforce? One thing is sure, you know, based on this slide here, we, we do need to, to, to come to some kind of understanding, you know, what do we need to understand to create a plan to, to create this path or get on this path? What do we need to know? Um, the big, biggest thing for me is what do we need to do differently? Santa Monica College does a lot of things well. We most certainly do. But in this area, when it comes to diversifying our workforce and ensuring equity within our workforce, especially our faculty, what do we need to do differently? And I recognize that's a much bigger discussion that, that we can't really get into today, but it's a discussion that we have to have. And I think we've been trying to have it. Um, and I know Treshawn is gonna talk a little bit about the screening committees and some, and some other things as well. But what do we need to do differently? Everyone here today needs to think long and hard about that. HR does all day, every day. What can we do differently um, to ensure that when we've done the best we can do with the recruitment of faculty and our pools are diverse, how do we, how do we help the committees make decisions to get these people in the queue to get to that final interview with Dr. Jeffrey and her committee to make that decision to hire something that we don't have sometimes, right? Again, I always say diversity is more than ethnicity, truly. But at the end of the day, at this institution, if we're trying to mirror our student body, we need to do some things differently within our hiring practices as well. But that's not necessarily just HR's responsibility. That's the responsibility of the selection committee. Um, any decisions that are made when it comes to, to, to determining who we're going to offer a position to at this college. And then how do we hold ourselves in the institution accountable? Again, that's, that's, that's a challenge. Um, one might say, we need to do more training and so forth and so on, blah, 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 blah. We do, we do, we do. But we also need to ensure that our policies are updated. Um, like I said, training is important. It most certainly is. But maybe we need to do tra training differently. Um, we all need to hold ourselves accountable when we're serving on these hiring committees. And we're doing our, the, the very best that we can to ensure that we're being fair and consistent in our practices, but also ensuring that we are uh, doing what's in the best interest of not just the institutions, but the, the departments and the students as well. And if we know that our student population is reflected in some form or fashion, um, we also need to make sure that our workforce reflects the same. Next slide, Cyrus. So again, the challenge of changing demographics, and I've already talked a little bit about this, 
So this, uh, these graphs show our full-time faculty in 2019. Again, the SERP has changed that a little bit, it has. And then our student ethnicity in 2019 as well. And again, I'm gonna refer you to page 56 for a short narrative, but also appendix three, which uh, provides the ethnicity by employee groups from 2006 to 2019. A lot of data there. And again, I want you to review those pages because it shows you our progression or lack thereof as well. Look at our full-time faculty. Look at our student ethnicity in these graphs. The student demographics at the college have truly shifted and changed over the years. I've already talked about that. But unfortunately, the faculty demographics do not reflect this shift. Look at it. 56% of our full-time faculty were Caucasian, 17% uh, Hispanic, 12% uh, African-American and Asian 12%. And so you might ask, why is this the case? Why isn't the, move, the, the needle moving? And I'm going to turn it over to Treshawn, Dr. Treshawn Hall Baker to kind of talk about possibly why this is the case, why the, the needle is not moving. Hello. Yes. Hello, everyone. So I really want you all to get excited about the work that we're talking about here because it's going to take all of us, like, like Sherry said, for us to move the needle. And you'll hear move the needle over and over today because we want to make sure that although it may be an overused phrase, you know that it's, it's exactly what we're trying to do. Um, oh, Cyrus, you can go ahead and advance the slide. Um, you know, I'm not only talking about the people who are here today, I'm talking about the people who are not here because that's one of the biggest barriers we have. We need to make sure we bring in the entire college community so that we could engage everyone to get into this work and to do the things that we need to do. And that brings me to talk about academic culture. Our academic culture is the foundation of a lot of things that we do here. And unless we start there at our foundation and, and, and try to change our foundation to move the needle forward, uh, we won't see much change. We all love S SMC, I do too. I love SMC, I love being here, I love the people. But one of the most important things we need to do is know that the way that SMC is doing things could, could be changed and we could all benefit from what that change looks like. For instance, if we're talking about academic culture and we look at our, acad our applicant pools, uh, like Sherry said, our academic, um, our applicant pools start off very di diverse. We've had so many discussions with our chairs. We've engaged our chairs to help them look in the right direction as far as advertising um, vacancies that they may have. And then HR works really closely with them doing that. However, from the point of inception of that pool moving forward, it looks very different. One thing that HR has instituted um, in the last few years is bringing the diversity of that pool to the forefront. So we get a very diverse pool from the beginning. It goes through a process of screening, um, initial selection, I'm sorry, initial um, selection interview, and then it goes to the superintendent president. At all of those levels, we are making sure we track what the diversity looks like so that we can know what we're doing with these applicant pools that end up with a less diverse outcome. We're also making sure that Dr. Jeffrey sees what that looks like um, by giving her a breakdown of the diversity. Now, right now we're focusing a lot on um, race and ethnicity, but that also includes gender and ability. So that's important to note. Another thing is our screening committees. Our screening committees are another SMC practice that we may wanna look at changing. Um, that SMC practice dictates exactly how we build those committees. Those committees are built by, uh, um, by having four um, full-time faculty from the discipline or like discipline. If we don't have those four full-time um, faculty, um, four to six full-time faculty, I should say. It includes two administrators and it includes an EEO rep. So perhaps we should consider including a student. Perhaps we should include having to 
put someone on there that is different from the rest of the group. Because if we're looking at historically at how SMC's faculty, both um, part-time and full-time look based on the graphs Sherry um, shared with you, you'll see that we are very white. And, 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 and that's okay because before us, it's, it's okay only in this sense, because before now, the processes that were in place did not dictate us to, to have change but now we're trying to make change. So that's one thing that could be a barrier that we may want to we want may want to look at. Our full-time and part-time pools again. When we look at the student population and I'm going to drop something in the chat right now um, which will give you more about our student population. On our website, if you don't believe what we're telling you, go to our website, you can even go to the state chancellor's website and you could see exactly what our student population looks like. Um, based on the student headcount. I engage you all who are here for, and I'm gonna call this a call to action now, another trendy phrase. All, all of you who are here that wanna see change, it's important that you know what we're dealing with and what we need to change, okay? As I tell the selection um, committees, uh, the screening committees is, it's, it's not that we're not, it's not that we wanna reject the white male, okay? It's not that we want to do that, but we also don't want to reject, let's say, the Asian or Latin, um, you know, female. We want to make sure that we are all inclusive when we look at our applicant pools and that we are not trying to find someone that looks like us. So if I'm Treshawn Hall Baker, Dr. Treshawn Hall Baker, I'm not looking for Dr. Treshawn Hall Baker part two. I'm not looking for that person with um, a PhD or a black girl with you know, curly braids in her hair. I'm looking for that person that can best serve our students. And if we put that first along with minimum quals, we will see different outcomes, okay? Going on to the next slide. Again, when we're talking about academic culture, faculty input and participatory governance is really important, okay? If the faculty that are on this call today and even the classified and administrators if when we go into our participatory governance environments we look at gearing what our pools look like on what our student population looks like we can make change we can change policies we can change procedures but we have to do that collectively let me tell you about something we're doing on the state level a lot of the different constituency groups on the state level um, in a process that was facilitated by the state chancellor's office, the constituency groups are coming together because we all wanna see change. And that change is gonna come from the top down. So if you're a part of the academic Senate, the state academic Senate is working with the state human resources groups to come together with best practices that will help us all see the change that we need. And the change that we need is geared directly to our students. It's not about me. It's not about you. It's not about what we used to do or the SMC way. It's about seeing change that will best support our students. So I encourage you that when this all plays out, you, you be active. You be active, not passive, and getting out there to see what change you could make. We are also looking at um, the Board of Trustees policies. We want to make sure that whatever we're finding in our listservs and in our professional groups, we're bringing back to those policies so that we can inform the board of what needs to happen, what needs to change. We're looking at putting together a list of trainings, not only for all of our uh, constituency groups on campus, but also for our board, because we know that this change is high level change that also needs to be grassroots at the same time. Another barrier in academic culture is longevity. Like Sherry said, people stay here a very long time. And it's hard to change minds when we have a process that appeared to work because we have some really good faculty here that have appeared to work except for it missed the diversity mark. So we wanna, we wanna figure out how to change minds of people who have been here and who have put in a lot of work. And I don't wanna discount any of that work to see what is needed now because the demographics have changed again not only at santa monica college but also in the county and because those the, the demographics have changed so dramatically 
we need to make a dramatic change here. So we can no longer sit back and watch everyone else make the change. We need to make the change ourselves one person at a time, one step at a time, one policy and procedure at a time, and then we need to pull in our colleagues to get buy-in from them. Another thing is preferred quals. So let me remind everyone here, you only need minimum quals to be hired uh, here at Santa Monica College. You need minimum quals. However, a lot of people confuse minimum quals with preferred quals. That means that what I hear sometimes in when I do the um, orientation, um, the orientations for um, selection committees is about preferred quals and how we want to have this, um, um, this, I'm going to say sorority view, like we all need to be alike. We all need to have PhDs. We all need to have um, whatever the, the latest trend is in this discipline to move someone forward. But that's not the case. Because remember, we all have different worldviews. So perhaps the black male in the pool did not have the same access as that white full-time faculty that's, that's already in the department. So we have to first base our selection on the minimum quals, okay? And the minimum quals come from the state um, chancellor's office and the state academic senate. They built those minimum quals based on their expertise and what is needed in that discipline. So I don't think they missed the mark. Preferred quals come in later. Preferred quals do serve a purpose because let's say we're in a discipline like English. You're gonna get like 200 applicants and you may have 200 applicants that meet minimum quals. So what you need to do then is to figure out a, a, a nice size pool to move forward, perhaps introduce those preferred quals, but never let those preferred quals be the leading measure of how you move people forward because guess what? Preferred quals could be a barrier as well. We can go to the next slide. Let's talk about our internal applicant pools. When it comes to our internal applicant pools, it's important that um, we advertise and open it up to both our um, classified and adjunct faculty. However, as you see in the statistics, a lot of our adjunct faculty are maybe a friend of a full-time faculty member or a fraternity member of a full-time faculty member, someone that went to college with the full-time faculty member, someone that comes from that same affinity group in a lot of, in a lot of cases. So we have to fill, figure out different ways to build those applicant pools by using a, a more diverse group of people. So if we're looking at our adjunct faculty, we're not asking our best friend to apply. We're asking someone in that pool or everyone in that pool to apply so that we can give them an equal opportunity to compete. It, it is a competitive process. However, everyone needs to have that opportunity to do it. And all of those biases that come in like an affinity bias or you know, one of those other biases, and there's a number of them, um, before those come in, we need to make sure that they're checked at the door and we're giving everyone the opportunity. Sometimes it's hard to do because guess what? I wanna see my friend get a job at SMC as well, but I need to say to myself, what is best for our students? And that's what everyone else needs to do in an environment like this. Our department chairs have some, some power in this case because they are leading those internal pools that come from our, acad our um, adjunct faculty. They do have the opportunity to look at those pools first um, before HR does, and they're able to kind of make sure that they're reaching out to applicants that meet minimum quals to step up and apply. We have a very robust process, and it could be improved, everything can be, be improved at this point for our, um, our internal pools and our academic process um, for adjunct faculty um, that does require an EEO rep. And I would like to know, honestly, how many people use that process because I, I'm gonna admit first um, from an HR perspective that because we're a little more flexible with the adjunct process, it doesn't always go the way that it's supposed to go. So um, I wanna implore you if you're, an, if you're a, a department chair or if you're a lead or if you're looking at hiring adjunct faculty and building those internal applicant pools that you make sure you're including um, the process that we've built um, as far as um, bringing those pools up. 
Okay, another thing you want to do, and I'm going to um, keep going on this theme is even in our internal and external processes, reach out to those uh, groups personally as a faculty member and as a chair, reach out to those groups where you know diversity exists. So send an email saying, hey, we have this great opportunity at Santa Monica College, you know, please encourage your graduates. Um, your members to apply, share with your members, because again, HR can do so much, but we need to make sure that we're all participating in what needs to happen here at Santa Monica College to move the needle. We can go to the next slide, Cyrus. When it comes to our external pool, let me tell you about a couple of things Santa Monica has done recently. One, we built a list of great um, diversified um, advertisement sources. We want to make sure that if we do get a list of advertisement sources from our departments, if we don't see that um, diversity geared um, source on the list that we're adding it. We're looking at those advertisement sources. We're checking them to make sure that it's going to the right audience. And then we'll add on to that, um, to that source if we don't see one geared towards um, diversity. But I have to say, you know, I've been um, doing this work um, since 2018, you know, after Sherry promoted, and our chairs have done a great job at making sure they adjust um, how they, they um, gear their advertisement. So I do appreciate them stepping up to the plate um, to make, make the change. Um, when it comes to the, the job fair, we have started a job fair, I think, um, the, we did it twice. This would have been year three, but then COVID happened. A part of that job fair is intentionally putting SMC on the map for those hard to reach groups. Uh, we want to make sure that they know we're open to having you here at SMC. SMC is a great place. Come on in, come visit us. And not only are we going to set you up with all of our departments and our job bulletins and you know introduce you to our chairs, but we're also gonna teach you how to manipulate um, our applicant tracking system, our, um, our processes here so that you could apply and be successful. We've put together a panel of dynamic faculty at different levels of um, tenure here at SMC, meaning um, first year faculty, third year faculty, tenured faculty, part-time faculty, part-time to full-time faculty, so that you can know what their worldview looks like in the process to become faculty here at Santa Monica College. We feel like that's a tool because not everyone has that access to be successful here at Santa Monica College. And um, we want to help, you know, we, we want to eliminate that barrier of how I become faculty at Santa Monica College. Um, we're trying to grow that process so that we can do even more because we know that um, even more uh, needs to happen. With all of that said, our process remains competitive. So what that means is that hard to reach person, and I'm gonna, and I like to use a, a, a black woman because that's who I am. Um, that means that um, when a black woman comes to apply, she still has to meet all of the standards. She still has to apply. She still has to um, make sure she gets all of the requirements in and then she would still have to compete for that job by meeting minimum quals, go through the interview process and final interview. There are no free passes here at Santa Monica College. If you are able to compete in this process, you should have an equal opportunity to, to have a job here at Santa Monica College, okay? We can go to the next slide, Cyrus, thank you. So the screening committees, what do our screening committees look like? Again, um, our screening committees are um, traditional. And when I talk to other colleges, it sounds like they're a lot alike. So we're not too far behind, but let me tell you, a lot of those, those colleges are trying to change how they do things just like us. Again, there's a, um, a minimum of four, a maximum of six faculty members, full-time faculty members uh, on, the, um, on the hiring committee. And then we have two academic administrators we have one of those faculty members operating as the um, EEO rep, the Equal Employment Opportunity Rep, and that equal opportunity, the Equal Employment Opportunity Rep is an outside member. They're not a part of the department. 
We do have mandatory trainings, which um, by the way, we, are, we will be improving in the, in the near future. We have mandatory trainings for all of our committees. Um, they're required to complete those mandatory trainings once in academic year. I think that um, since I've been doing the trainings, I've gotten better um, at making sure that I put equity, inclusion, diversity up front, and I am not tiptoeing around it. I am not trying to go easy on anyone. I am trying to make sure that everyone knows how important, again, moving the needle is. So um, you should sit in on one. I'll be happy to have you. If you haven't been in one, um, you can be, a, especially in a Zoom environment, um, come on in. I'm happy to let you see how we, we're trying to move things forward. The committee chair um, is our department chair or designee. Most of the time it's a department chair because guess what? We have some great department chairs here and our department chairs are really vested in this process. And they know that um, and if they don't know, I'm telling them the integrity of the process is important. So if I get feedback about the integrity of the process being jeopardized because someone said something that was discriminatory in nature, someone was given an, a, an, a, an unfair advantage or disadvantage, or um, someone was looking for you know, a candidate that was just like them, um, we're going to talk about that. We're going to have those discussions because that can jeopardize the entire process and you may not get another one. So that share is truly vested in how we do things. Also tribal culture, we're getting away from tribal culture. Okay. Again, um, a lot of people used to say we're looking for fit, but guess what fit is? Fit is tribal culture. We need to get away from that. We don't want people who look like us. Again, we don't want people who fit our way of doing things we want people who can serve our students, can meet our students where they are, who are equity minded. You know, all of the buzzwords right now, which by the way, have existed for a very long time, except for we are moving this forward in a way like no other right now. So we need to make sure we get away from tribal culture and we embrace getting the best possible candidate to serve our students by looking at everyone equally, okay? Our EEO and district regs. Now, another part of the process is for me to send out those EEO and district regs that we work really hard on. Um, we want you to take time to read those EEO policies and district regs so that you can become familiar with how we're trying to do things. And by the way, this is a working document. What you see now could change in three years because we wanna make sure that we continue to move the, the needle forward. We wanna continue to make sure we do better. Um, I tell my sons all the time, good, better, best. Never let it rest till your good gets better and your better gets best. And everything that I do here at Santa Monica has that same theme. I want to I wanna do better every day and I'm, I, I want us all to do better every day. Then there's implicit and explicit bias. Becomes really tricky, okay? Yeah, because sometimes we don't know we have those biases. And what I tell our committees is you need to maybe pull out a piece of paper and write down any biases that you think you may know and check those biases at the door. Even if you're in the moment of assessing a candidate and that candidate is different from you in any way, ability, gender, sexual orientation, you need to stop and write down whatever that biases is and throw it in the trash because none of that matters when we're looking for who can best serve our students. So if you see someone that checks all of the bo boxes, they're great, but their sexual orientation is different from what you believe in, you need to tell yourself, okay, how can I resolve, how can I mitigate whatever um, biases, how could I bracket these biases and set them aside um, to mitigate whatever I'm feeling inside? Because a bias belongs to you. It only belongs to you. It doesn't belong to the process. It doesn't belong to the person. So we need to make sure that we are clear in how we assess our candidates as they come in. Okay, next slide. So our part-time, our full-time and part-time faculty, and Sherry touched on some of this. Again, if you, if you open up our um, diversity report, you'll see on pages 25 and 27, um, what our, demographics look like when it comes to um, 
um, eth ethnicity and race and ethnicity. I, I, I want you all as a homework assignment to go and really have a look at that and then look at your department and see what your department looks like. Look at what our student population looks like by using the link that I gave you. Pay close attention to our associate faculty. That's important because remember a lot of times at a lot of colleges, our associate faculty are feeders into our full-time faculty. A lot of times we, we take our associate faculty and promote them, which is a very good thing. However, sometimes doing that, we miss the mark as far as diversity is concerned. So I wanna make sure that you have a look at that um, and that you, you take some time to really understand what it means when we have um, a, a student population with uh, a high number of, let's say, let's use Latinx for instance, our Latinx according to our website today is at 37% as far as race and ethnicity. And then you take a look at um, Latinx in our, our um, full-time faculty, which is 17%, and uh, in our, our part-time faculty, which is 14%. So um, it's important that we intentionally put these things in our mind because it will help us think differently how we move the needle forward, okay? Next slide, Cyrus. And I think I turn it over to Sherry. Yeah. Yeah, next slide. Okay, thank you, Trayshawn. So I know you're probably thinking, why are we talking about associate faculty again? Because, you know, in all the years that I've, that I've been here um, at the college, uh, we, we didn't have this special designation. We did not. Um, but, you know, we, we're talking about challenges, right? So Becoming an associate faculty member is like winning the lotto, the lottery. You've seen that movie, Charlie in the Chocolate Factory. It's like having that golden ticket. It truly is. Because it is a special, it's, it's a special status. You have to be eligible to become an associate faculty member. Um, and there are some limitations, there are. But at the end of the day, the category, which is by the way, um, this is a designation afforded to adjuncts, if eligible, uh, pursuant to the collective bargaining agreement. That's huge. So this is not going anywhere. It isn't, but I have to keep saying it still presents a challenge for the, for the district when it comes to diversifying our, um, our adjunct ranks, for sure. So if eligible, these individuals receive assignments before any other part-time faculty member that does not have associate faculty status. It's, it's almost like a guaranteed right of employment unless you do something that falls within the CBA that will um, determine that you should not have AS status. But the result of having this special status is this expectation, as a slide says, of longevity as a part-time faculty member. Remember I said earlier, people come and they stay. And that's even amongst our, our adjuncts, our part-time ranks, especially those who have associate faculty status. So in 2019, 458 out of 1,019 part-time faculty members have associate faculty status. That's almost half, almost half. Next slide, Cyrus. And because almost half of them have associate faculty members, and as I said earlier, enrollment is declining. Yes, part-timers are losing classes because enrollment is, is declining. But then when we're not able to bring in new people, what we're left with are the associate faculty members and whatever that looks like. So let me walk you through this just a little bit. So right now, as I said earlier, and it's on this screen, more than 61% of our associate faculty members are Caucasian. Only 12% are Hispanic. And remember what our student body looks like as well. I talked a little bit about the collective bargaining agreement. Like I said, this is an, a right uh, this is an employment right to a certain extent for, for our adjuncts. It's a wonderful thing. Don't get me wrong. It's, it's a great benefit. But again, I have to keep saying it creates a challenge for us because we have so many of them and they don't represent the diversity of our student population. Again, longevity. Associate faculty members stay forever. Wouldn't you? <laughs> 
would who would want to give that up if you weren't full time and you had a guaranteed right of two classes every semester, no matter what. Who wouldn't want that? It's an absolute incredible benefit. But the problem is it doesn't, when we have associate faculty who stay forever and who happen to be not people of color, there's, these people aren't going anywhere. We don't have an opportunity to come behind them and, 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 and change things. Age. They're also an older population. Now, again, the SERP, a lot of them, a lot of them took the SERP, they did. But it didn't move the needle like we would have hoped. 76% of them over the age of 60 are Caucasian. 42% of all associate faculty members, of all of them, are over the age of 60. So if people don't move on, we're not able to come behind them to do things differently or to make change or to work towards diversifying our adjunct ranks with the hopes, as Treshawn said, that a lot of them become full-time faculty. Now the, the CBA, the collective bargaining agreement, uh, doesn't guarantee that. Uh, associate faculty, all part-timers still have to compete. Uh, there, there's no automatic right to a full-time position. But they're still part of that, of that pool. And unfortunately, there probably is an expectation uh, that they become full-time at some point in time, but, but we're not set up that way at this point. So again, some of these things are, are create, do create barriers for us. Uh, next slide, Cyrus. And so I talked about moving the needle and, and how special having the status is. But look what's waiting in the wings here. It looks the same. So again, there are some limitations on uh, associate faculty members, meaning that the departments cannot have a percentage of, uh, there's a, a, only a percentage of people can be or hold associate faculty status within a department. Okay, so there are some, some limitations. Everyone can't be associate faculty, even if they qualify, even if they're eligible. But look at the, the percentages here of associate faculty members that are eligible, but haven't yet been awarded. These are people next in line. So when that first group moves on, they retire, they resign, maybe they decide they just don't wanna work here, you know, whatever it is. This is what's waiting in the wings. Still people with a lot of longevity at the district the majority of them are still Caucasian and they're over the age of 60. So the stats really don't, don't change. Again, moving that needle for us is really important. And although, like I said, associate faculty status is, is like the golden ticket, it's like winning the lotto, it creates a different kind of challenge for Santa Monica College when we are trying to at the very least, because we have more opportunity to do so amongst the adjuncts to move that needle and diversify the staff. Again, some departments are doing well, but if you look at the diversity report, again, I encourage you to look at the diversity report, the, the, the appendices that uh, do an overview of the department, with what the department looks like. It's very telling, it's very telling. And it will be difficult to make changes in those areas to move that needle if in fact the associate faculty members that are currently in place and waiting in the wings remain. It's gonna be a huge challenge for us. So again, just wanted to point that out, but I, I do encourage you to look at the, um, at the appendices in these areas. So I'm gonna turn it over now to Lori. Um, Sherry, I think we have a, actually have a couple of questions that um, have been populating in oh, the Oh, sure. Yeah. No, go ahead. So I think the first one, um, I think I've already uh, 
I've already uh, forwarded over to Treshawn. Treshawn, uh, would, you, would it be okay if you could read the question, uh, the comment on the question? Okay, let me see if I can go ahead and find that question again. <laughs> <laughs> would, it, would it be better All if right. I... Sorry, yes, please. can we, can we, let's, can we do this? Can we finish the presentation? Sure. I, I, I anticipate there, be, there will be a lot of, of questions at the end. Gotcha. Um, okay. So let's do that. Let's move through because it's 11-11. Okay, sounds good. <laughs> okay, thank you. So hold, hold on to your questions, people. So Lori, please, uh, can we, Cyrus, can you go to the next slide? Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you, Sherry and Trishan. Uh, so how do we respond to the barriers? This slide shows that, that all of our responses are interconnected. Everything we do affects everything else. We have faculty and staff of color. We have an equity movement that is burgeoning here at the college and throughout the country. We have students who are changing how we do things. And then we have the issue of funding. And obviously funding is a huge piece of this puzzle because our recruitment depends in a great extent on our funding. And in the last four years, we've had a very robust funding allotment from the district to advertise. As you've heard, we've expanded our advertising to different uh, groups and institutions and publications. Um, and that has had an effect maybe not a huge effect, but it has effect. And the needle is moving a little bit, but we have entered an era, an era now where our funding sources are limited, more limited, and we don't know how much more limited we're gonna find them. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. So this slide, you, you know, just remember that this was, this presentation was developed in March prior, just prior to COVID. And obviously we've done a lot of work in the last seven months under equity. But what we really want to point out here is that in order to continue to move that needle forward towards diversity, we really need to continue to take a multi-dimensional effect and that equity must be foundational to all institutional initiatives. This is critical. Every decision that we make when it comes to recruitment and hiring um, must be using the, the lens of equity. And we need to incorporate diversity and equity in all aspects of recruitment and retention Next, next slide, please. So what are we looking at? We have our mission statement. These are things that SMC is already doing. We have our mission statement. We have the institutional learning outcomes. And we have some collaboration with cross college committees. But we can improve that. And in fact, um, this last week, we had a, um, a series of meetings with um, regarding professional development here at the college. And one of the big ideas that came through in those meetings was the need for more collaboration uh, between different college groups when it comes to professional development. And the more we can incorporate that idea, the more we can incorporate the the trainings that we have on equity and the affinity groups and the bias uh, subjects, then we will continue to move that needle forward. Next slide, please. Cyrus, can we have the next slide? Did we lose Cyrus? Oh. 
Cyrus? Can you hear me? Oh, I wonder what happened. Did what freeze? happened to Cyrus? <laughs> maybe yeah. his, Maybe we have a freeze. Um, so what I'll do is I'll, I'll go ahead and take over. Yeah, it looks like Cyrus dropped. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you all for your patience with technology. Um, <laughs> it happens, right? So I'm going to go yeah. ahead and um, pull up the PowerPoint and share my screen. And that way we won't miss a beat, hopefully. All right. Um, from the beginning. Hold on, I'm getting there. Um, you all see my screen? Yes. Great. Yep. All right. So let me go ahead and get to the slide. Um, uh, let me do this. And Lori, you're on slide 23, right? I think so, yeah. Yes. Okay. Here we go. That way I don't make everyone dizzy trying to get there. <laughs> there we go. Okay. Uh, 24, go. actually. Mm -hmm. So the big question, how can we incorporate these lessons into our work? Trey, Sean, if you change display setting to switch it'll get rid of the side screen oh the side screen okay is that it yeah that click it? that one this one there we go okay go wonderful mm -hmm. um i think we need to go back a slide um we're on 24. yeah you see 24? I just see 26. Um, anyway, you know, we can, we can just move from here. That's fine. That's fine. So, okay. mm -hmm. so we're talking about here, the expansion of the applicant. Utilize all resources existing faculty resources, former applicants, increase in focus advertising, video conferencing, Sky, Skype interviews, and travel reimbursements. We do all this. We do all this. But what can we do in order to expand even greater our applicant pool? Because when you look at the statistics, particularly the Hispanic statistics of applicant pools, that is where we really need to refocus some of our energy and to find a way to to um, reach those applicants that we want to bring into this process. Okay, so you know me. Let's regroup for a minute. <laughs> Let's do that. <laughs> yeah, and Cyrus unfortunately had some internet issues, so he apologizes. So this is where this is where we left off, Lori. This is your your slide here. Okay. Oh, thank you. Okay. Yes. Okay. So oh. so you can oh, okay. wrap this one up. Okay. okay. We'll go forward. Sorry about that, guys. No, no, no. So, so how can we incorporate these lessons into our work? So obviously, you know, strong and clear message of equity, diversity, and inclusivity. For the last several years, I think we've we've really gotten on that path. We've established the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusivity website at SMC. If you want to find out what we're doing towards diversity, um, equity, inclusivity, you go to that website. We have policies. We have our resources. It's a one-stop shop for all of that information. Um, and it's added to as things come online. Also, our Equity Summit and trainings. We are currently in the middle, HR is currently in the middle of um, presenting a series of trainings on diversity and equity. We've had um, a presenter, Kimberly Papillon. A lot of you have already 
seen her. She's been here several times. Um, and she's got one more presentation. Um, I think it's November 12th. Uh, but we also have some really fabulous presenters. We have Greg Smith coming, who is now at San Diego. Um, and he will be presenting information on understanding data. And of course, data is really super important to what we're doing here, as the diversity report shows you and what, and as we've been talking about during this entire presentation. Next, next slide, please. All right, so thank you, Lori. Um, can you guys all hear me? Yes. Oh, okay, thank you, because I, now I can't see my screen. But anyway, um, thank you all. And, and, and you know what, I'm also going to say a shout out to my SMC folks who, you know, give us passes when technology does not work exactly how you need it to work. So I appreciate you all being patient with us as we go through this. Yes, thank um, you. <laughs> so some of the things that we're doing um, here at SMC and what we need to do in partnership with all of you um, on this Zoom is to continue to develop language that incorporates EEO equity and equivalency um, language. We need to make sure that we build it together because again, we have to do this together. Uh, like I said, in recent times, we've worked with the Academic Senate here at SMC to develop new equity language to put right onto our job announcements. So if you've recently seen our job announcements, the very first thing you see is our, our equity language, um, which again was built in conjunction with our Senate and then also with our chairs. The reason why this is important is because you'll have those candidates and believe it or not, I've gotten calls from those candidates that say, I don't like what you're saying about equity. I don't think it's fair, I don't like it. And so right away, you have those people turn away because we, we need them to know immediately what SMC is about and what we're trying to do. But then again, you have more candidates than you will believe who are excited about the language that they see in our, um, in our job bulletins because we are really trying to make a difference here and be a leader at this at Santa Monica College. I've gotten calls from other districts that appreciate the approach that we're taking by putting equity first up front, by making diversity something that's up front. Um, and that's first in the things that we do. And, and, and it's becoming more and more of the, fa the fabric here at Santa Monica. Another thing you should know, and this is, this is um, break, breaking news, kind of, sort of, but um, Title V will be changing soon to also put equity, diversity, and racism at the front of um, what is out there. It's in the process now to change. And so that language from, directly from Title V uh, will go directly into our job announcement as well, we hope, because we want to make sure that, you know, the theme of the state is, is the theme of SMC, because again, the reflection of LA County, of the state of California, and is exact, and our student population are the same. They're, they're virtually the same. So again, what you see in the demographics in each of those groups, you'll see they almost mirror each other. So outreach um, and expansion of the, the applicant pools. Um, what, what, again, what we need you to do, and, and, and by the way, I don't, wanna, I don't want classified to feel like they're being left out. Um, somehow, some way classified is closer to where we need to be, our classified rank. So you know, kudos to our personnel commission and to um, people who are coming in that are of you know, diverse background to make us look really good when it comes to our, our classified ranks. Um, but what we need to do um, is we need to utilize our resources. Again, um, our chairs and our faculty, if you know affinity groups that you could reach out to, again, we need you to send personal emails to those groups, you know, with, let's say, Maria Munoz at the bottom or Howard Stahl at the bottom that says, come and apply for this job that we are, um, that we are posting so that we can get those groups applying and becoming a part of um, our SMC family. Um, reach out to former applicants. If you know that there was this great candidate that just did not make it to the final interview or did not make it to um, the final selection or recommendation to the board, feel free to call them up to tell them apply. Make sure you do it before the process actually starts because um, then there is no conflict of interest. Just let them know, you know, this job is coming. Go ahead and apply and then step away and let HR handle the rest. We're going to increase how we focus our advertising. Um, like I said, we built that list 
We're going to continue to use that list as we send out um, those advertising advertisements and um, we pull in those diverse pools or we continue to pull in those diverse pools and then we make everyone accountable as it goes through the process. So at the screening, why does it look like um, this as opposed to what it looked like when you first got the pool? And then when it goes to the selection interview, why does it look like this as opposed to a what the pool looked like initially. And then when it gets to Dr. Jeffrey in the final interview, you know, we're able to hold each pro each person at each part of the process accountable to why the final group looked the way, the way that it did. So, you know, COVID has been devastating for all of us. Well, not, not all of us, I can't, I can't make that claim because I've actually been doing okay, um, I'm blessed. However, our process has been blessed by COVID as well because video conferencing used to be a major major barrier, major barrier um, when it comes to our hiring process because most committees opted to not do video conferencing. And what did that mean? It meant that if you had diverse candidates that were across the country that were would be perfect for Santa Monica College, they wouldn't be able to participate if they did not have the funds to make it to, um, to California for an interview. And the committees get to opt whether or not they want to do video, video, video conferencing. And um, a lot of them said no. A lot of them opted to not have video conferencing, which in some cases eliminated an entire group of candidates from the pool. And we've had many people advocate for it. And many people you know, call me on the side to say, I'm really trying to get this committee to, to do video conferencing so we can see these candidates. And it, it, it all ended up in a failure. But now all we have is video conferencing. So I'm hoping that a lot of people who are participating in the process embrace um, the video conferencing. We do have travel reimbursement. It's not 100%. However, it does exist. Um, that is one area where, you know, we, we, we are at least trying to accommodate our candidates. We can do better. We can do better. Uh, maybe after all of this is over, all, all of the pandemic is over. Um, however, if we do institute video conferencing, we may not see many travel reimbursements. So, I mean, um, it is a tool. And um, again, in all of these aspects, we can do better, okay? Training. We wanna continue to train. As um, you, you know, you've seen our equity series, which is this is a part of now. We're going to bring in Greg Smith. Um, I believe it's next week. Lori, help me out. I think it's next week. He is a, a yes. fellow HR professional, but a great um, statistician who will come in and show you what all of the numbers mean in a very informing, meaningful, and fun way. So I highly recommend you attend because. It's a training that will help you understand why we need to make changes at Santa Monica College. Great training. I am um, pushing it. So please, if you haven't already registered for uh, Greg Smith's training. Our compliance team has a number of trainings um, which are compliance based. And, and that's important as well because we have a lot of compliance from the state. However, it's also um, personally and professionally empowering. I think that attending these trainings can only make you a better person, although a lot of them come with what you need to do um, as, an, as an employee, a school employee. Uh, but it's very um, empowering and enlightening as a person prof um, professionally and personally. So uh, keep your eyes out for all of those trainings that they do. Um, Lisa Winter uh, leads that group. So um, keep your eyes open for that. And they're, they're also willing to come and do one-on-one -on -one trainings with your department or one on however many are in your department and um, more uh, personal trainings geared towards what you're looking for. So please feel free to reach out to Lisa Winter for those. Um, we have a, a, a commitment to doing this because we brought in Cyrus Fernandez who maybe he's back on now, but he's put together many suites, many suites for all employee groups um, for us to continue training in our institution. And then he's found um, options outside of our institution to keep us informed and help us grow in this area of diversity, inclusion, and equity. Our EEL trainings, um, we're building on it. Again, our EEL trainings will always be a draft, in my opinion, because we always, again, want to do better. And so you'll see us get better and better with each training that we do as far as EEO is concerned, equal employment opportunity.
All right, so our applicant pool. When it comes to our applicant pools, again, um, we've built that tracking system in it so that you could follow that. And I've talked about that a bit um, a while ago. Um, I, I personally look at every pool that comes through to make sure that there's diversity in every area. Um, that's why it's important for people to um, um, tell us you know, it's a voluntary question, but it's good when they tell us because it informs us of what our pool looks like and what we're moving forward. We're working on additional uh, tools for our applicant pools. This may be far off, but we would love to look at a process that eliminates letters of recommendation. We would love to look at the process that is blind where you can't see the names because there are studies that show that when we see the names, sometimes our biases creep in. I'm trying to figure out what that person may or may not be. We've developed a matrix um, that um, takes away arbitrary scoring of applicants and makes it more of a, more of a um, standardized um, based on minimum quals and then preferred quals process of screening our applicants so that we're not basing it on something that's personal or something that's a bias. Um, and then anything else that you wanna suggest um, and although we have a lot of things on tap, we welcome you to suggest it because um, the thing about HR at Santa Monica College, we don't do any of this in the vacuum. We don't feel like it's all our way or the highway. We are open to suggestions because we know that we need to grow as an institution and we want to make this a collaborative experience. And Treshawn, if I could just interject real quickly, um, you know, because we are, we have to work with the Senate. Uh, this is participatory governance like no other. And there's a committee called the Personnel Policies Committee. And that is the committee that looks at the hiring reg for, uh, for faculty specifically. And so, you know, Treshawn brings up some of the things that we'd like to see uh, be moved out of the process to eliminate barriers. One of those, as she mentioned, was the letters of recommendation, um, of course. You know, if you are a faculty member um, and you, I don't want to say you, you agree with that, but I, I encourage you all to, especially the faculty, to get involved um, in these issues, provide feedback to uh, the academic senate, especially when it comes to this particular policy. It drives everything that we do in hiring of, of faculty. And it's a committee that consists of not just uh, faculty, but administrators are present as well. And I serve as vice chair. Uh, it's a great committee. We do really good work. Uh, but it would be great to hear from uh, the, the other faculty members as well. So make sure that your voice is heard. You know, Treshawn said we want your ideas on things that we can do. One of the ways you can provide your ideas as well is through that, that particular academic Senate committee. So I just wanted to throw that out there. Yeah, and, and buy-in is important. I mean, yeah, if we're, we're all moving in the right direction or in the same direction, um, not based on the same ideas, but a collection of ideas, because right. remember when we come together and we, we, we build ideas together, there is some diversity. And that cross-functional work is important. I mean, what the faculty have to say, what the classified have to say, the academic senate, the, the faculty association, it's important because when we, we do it together, we come up with the right answer and, and, and something that everyone can live with. So this is a plea for everyone to, to, to get involved and, and do what you can. So um, we do use an applicant tracking system and in that applicant tracking system, we're able to pull stats and again, make sure you participate in Greg Smith's um, presentation. And this is what our stats look like when we pull it. This is um, a particular um, set of data from the tenure track uh, faculty recruitment for cell and, and evolution biology. Um, I, I can't give you any point of reference in time other than this was in the last two years um, of how the pool looked like in, the, in every step of the process. So step one, is when the application closed. And then step two is what was moved forward to the committee. Um, step three shows you what was moved forward to the committee interview, which is different than the actual committee search. And then um, the next step is the final interview and it what it's exactly what goes to 
um, Dr. Jeffrey. And so, um, and then Dr. Jeffrey makes a recommendation to the board. Uh, and so if we go back and look at, let's say our, let me see if I, let's look at Latinx. And um, I'm imagining that, so at Latinx, we started with eight um, candidates and then we went to six um, at the hiring committee process and then to four at the initial interview. And when it came to the final interview, we were down to one. Um, they, I, I have to give um, Alex Towers uh, credit um, because she's really working hard. This is one of the areas that are, are less diverse than our other departments. So Alex is really doing what she can to work hard to make sure that she, um, fosters a sense of diversity in her processes and what she does. We have many conversations about it. And um, as you can see, it ended up being in the final, um, um, it, it ended up having some, having some diversity. So, um, and then who, who ended up getting the job, as you see, was, was here, okay? So we're using tools like this to inform us throughout the process um, and uh, this data is really important to the to the work that we do, okay? Um, and to the next slide. Okay, so we're at 1137. I'm gonna wrap these next few slides up really, really quickly so that we can uh, answer some of your questions. And of course, you know that myself, Trishan, Lori, any of our HR people are available to ask questions at any time. Doesn't have to be just during this particular uh, presentation. So, so to wrap this up, the district has, has focused a lot on equity as it relates to the students and closing the equity gaps as they should, most definitely. Everything we do is about our students. But any and all goals related to student equity must include diversity and equity in our hiring practices. It has to. Again, we keep saying that we, that we need, we have to, we must move this, this needle. And so we have to be really intentional about what we are doing and how we are doing it. So, you know, what else, what else do we need to do? Here are some, some things to issues that we need to consider. You know, what is required for each ethnic group to feel welcome in an integral part of the community? That discussion should be taking place by department. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, department. Uh, yes, it should be a bigger discussion district-wide, but we do need to break it down some. And I do believe that the departments, the chairs especially, should be having these uh, conversations with their, uh, with their faculty members as well. You know, the job fair, which Trayshawn mentioned earlier, uh, was something I've always wanted to do at this district. And when I became VP, I like, all right, HRT, let's do this. We can make it happen. And it's been highly successful. But what's been so wonderful about that effort is that it was an outreach to people in the community to come to Santa Monica College. We want them to feel welcome at that level and come here and say, this is a great place to work. Diversity and equity is important to, to this institution. Uh, so we're gonna continue doing that probably in the spring, we have a new improved version for you. Uh, in regards to our, our job fair. But again, it's just so important for people on the outside and definitely people that are already work, working here, especially our new faculty members to feel welcome and to, be, to feel as if they are part of this, this college community, part of this family. You know, something else to consider, it always comes up, you know, what can the board do? What can they, what are they doing to promote and support diversity? Um, well, one thing they can do is demand it. And I think our board has, has done that through their goals and objectives as well. They have demanded that uh, the district take these issues seriously. They do support diversity. Uh, one of the things we are going to be doing with the board is providing them some training as well. Uh, you know, we all have to do compliance related training, but as a board, how better can they support us um, 
that is the million dollar question. How can they support us? But I feel, and I think a lot of you probably feel, they need to go through some trainings as well. I saw Trustee Amanoff in the meeting as well, and I'm sure she agrees with me uh, that there, there should be some more training for the board so that they can better understand what our issues are and, and what we're trying to do and how to move forward. Uh, something else to consider, and we've looked at this before, it's just been hard to get it off the ground, but it is a goal to create mentoring internship programs for specific departments. Like I said, some of our departments um, are struggling. They, they don't have the diversity that is needed. Uh, some of our bigger departments, I, I hate to admit that, have this issue, but they too can move the, the needle. And you know, creating mentor or internship programs within these departments, we talk a lot about reaching out to our graduate programs and so forth and so on. Um, there, there are a lot of things that we can do. And Treshawn has already talked about uh, tracking, but we also need to track our progress uh, as we move along in these efforts as well. Next slide, Cyrus. Oh, I'm sorry, Next, who's doing it? Treshawn, I'm sorry, next slide. <laughs> it's Cyrus automatically, I'm sorry. Do you see the next slide? No. Oh, God. Okay. It's okay. I'm gonna keep talking. Oh, okay. but you can see it on the. We can see it in the um, over here. You all see it on the side. Dime, nod your head if you can see it. The you next can slide. See it on the side, okay. It says establish a visible leadership commitment. Yeah, you can see so it yeah, thank you. So again, um, what's what's important here, and we've we've talked about this. The district always talks about this, that commitment starts at the top. And I'm here to tell you, as part of the senior staff team, part of Dr. Jeffrey's team, the commitment is there. The commitment is truly there. But it's not just the leadership, the senior leadership that needs to make these things happen. Yes, the senior leadership needs to support these things. And I'm telling you that senior leadership does. And it is visible. I think it's I think it's visible. I think it's viable. All of those things. But we do need to, as a as an institution, talk about what we want to achieve, what do we want to measure, and how are we going to continue to promote equity and diversity within our institution. I'd be remiss if I didn't bring up the 7525 goal. So basically what should be happening is that 75% of our full-time faculty, of, of our faculty should be full-timers and 25% should be adjuncts. This is a huge, huge issue on this particular campus. So I don't wanna sugarcoat it in any way because we are not there. And faculty will say, we need to reach this goal. We most certainly do. And the district agrees, we do. How we get there, is yet another challenge for us, especially in these budgetary times. But as the slide here says, define, establish clear expectations, define expectations, set goals, engage and teach. One of the goals is to reach this 75-25 benchmark. It is, but again, how are we going to get there? We have barriers, we have challenges at this point in time, outside of our budgetary challenges, that we need to fix also. Again, a much, much bigger discussion that needs to take place. But, but I had to bring that up because uh, as an HR representative in this district and we oversee this hiring process, yeah, that, that should be one of the goals within this district. How are, we, how, are we gonna, how are we gonna reach that goal? What's the expectation and how are we gonna reach that goal of ensuring that 75% of our full-timers are, uh, of our part of our, I'm sorry, of our faculty are full-timers. But more than that, of that 75%, as far as I'm concerned, how many of those will be people of color? And we have to ensure that that happens as well. You follow me? Next slide, Cyrus. Uh, Treshawn, I'm sorry. <laughs> So, you know, one of the things that, one of the needles that we have moved um, 
although you know we, we continue to talk about closing the equity gaps. But Dr. Jeffrey, we've included a quote from her here that says the increase in Hispanic and African-American transfers also speaks volumes to the urgent work taking place here to close the gap between our highest achieving student groups and those from racially minoritized groups. It is a heartening moment in the college's efforts towards becoming a more equitable institution. Like I said, we are the number one transfer institution. Um, what I'm happy to report, and it's on the next slide, is the fact that we have seen some increases uh, in, in students of color just transferring. It's, I think it's a big thing. I, I truly, truly do, considering what we're working with and all the challenges that our students have, uh, our faculty members, although not as diverse as they can be, have been working with uh, our students to ensure that they are moving forward. But again, there's just so much more that we can, that we can do. But this is a, a nice slide that we include. Remember, this was supposed to be for Harvard, uh, just to show them that we are making, we are making process, that the, the needle is moving insofar as um, our students of color, they are, they are succeed, some of them are succeeding. Um, we just know that we, as an institution, need to do everything in our power to ensure that they are succeeding in all areas. Next slide, and this is the last slide. And so again, there's been incremental change over time uh, in regards to our full-time faculty uh, as it relates to ethnicity. I said it earlier, incremental but steady. We have a lot of work to do. Uh, again, our workforce for the most part is diverse, but our biggest challenge right now is our, our faculty. I think we can do it. As Treshawn mentioned earlier, we need everyone involved, not just senior leadership, not just the board, but faculty, management, staff, even our students, we need their input as well. I wanna know what do you need? Um, and for human resources, that might be the next route for us is to start talking with our, with our students. Um, I think we can, we can move this needle. It's still gonna be slow, but I, but I think we can move it, but we've gotta to work together to do so. So as a slide says the future, we can do it. So that's our presentation. And I'm sorry I zipped through that last part because I want to leave time for, for questions at this point. And so this is a, uh, this last slide here shows our cover of our faculty and staff diversity report. Um, again, it was included in the chat. You know where to find it. I encourage you, strongly encourage everyone, not just folks here on this call, but uh, just district-wide, you read the numbers. Our diversity report tells a story. It tells a story. And I think if you read this story, you would be more inclined to do whatever it is you can do to help us move, move our district forward and to truly, truly uh, represent what is needed here to, to help our, our students succeed and, and move on. So let's take some questions. <laughs> 